Let's continue on the thought pattern that we left off in our last session. So Paul's first order of business in 2 Corinthians okay, was after assuring the Corinthians of his personal devotion to them was to answer the charge of being insincere. If you remember, he was being portrayed as somebody who was vacillating, somebody who was unreliable, somebody who was two-faced, somebody who was uh, cunning, somebody who was insincere because he did not fulfill his promise that he said that he was going to come. However, circumstances were developed in such a way that he could not come. Uh, in fact, even their hostile attitude uh, prevented him from coming at some point in time. But he expressed his love and his devotion to them. And so he does in a thorough but in a very tender hearted way. And I want you to understand something. It's very difficult to do. To express your love and your sincerity, your empathy in a very, in a very tender hearted way and yet be thorough about it. First of all, he flatly denies the allegation that he had been insincere. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and look at this in verse 12. Because, you see, you, uh, uh, the question I would ask you, can you defend yourself against insincerity? If not, repent. That's the best thing you can do, is repent. Look at verse 12. For our God, he says, for our proud confidence is this. This is what Paul is saying. The testimony of our conscience, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. He comes and he hits the subject straight on. He does not avoid it whatsoever. He deals with the issue straight on. Let's continue. He assures them that he has never spoken a word or written anything to them that was couched in deceit, that was concealed in double meanings, or otherwise bleeding. He assures them he never did that. His words are now written down for them to review along with his actions and the results of his actions and the results of his words. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, let's go back to it. We just read it. Now let's reread it again because I want to underscore this part for you. He says, for our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in holiness and godly sincerity. Now, here's the part that I want to underscore. Not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God. Not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God. We have conducted ourselves in the world, and especially toward you. Then underscore verse 13. He says, for we write nothing. Underscore this. Mark this. For we write nothing else to you than what you read and understand. And I hope you will understand until the end. I am what I am. I've written to you exactly. I mean what I say and I say what I mean. It's very clear, very direct. It's very transparent. And yet he was not ugly about it or smug or, or prideful about it. And then he assures them of his wholehearted love and commitment toward them. He, he just progressively does this. This is the reason why we've been going through all these verses on verse by verse by verse and unpacking it slowly and then allowing the word to take us to the different parts of the Bible to affirm and confirm what Paul is speaking about. Now we get to 2 Corinthians again. We return to verse 13. Because he assures them of his wholehearted love and commitment toward them. Look at what he says. Now we're going to underscore the last part of verse 13. For we write nothing else to you than what you read and understand. And then he says, and I hope, underscore, and I hope you will understand until the end. 
Just as you also partially did understand this underscore, just as you, you, you've, you've gotten a glimpse of this truth from us before. That we are your reason to be proud as you are also our, as ours in the day of our Lord Jesus. In the day of our Lord Jesus. Paul was pouring his heart out to them. He reassures them that when, you're, when, that when he originally planned his itinerary, it was his, it was his earnest intention and sincere de desire to come. That's what he wanted to do. In fact, he wanted to come twice to Corinth. Once on his way to Macedonia and again once on his way home. He was going to go to, to the northern part of Greece by way of the southern part by visiting Corinth. Then once he did that, he was going to return back to Corinth and then return on back to Asia Minor. That was his plan. Clearly, that was his plan. He let him know that. Look, look at verses 15 to 19. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 15 to 19. In this confidence, I, he says, in this confidence, I intended at first to come to you so that you might twice receive a blessing. He was going to come and he was going to go and both times on his way somewhere else, he was going to bless them both times. That is, to pass your way into Macedonia and again from Macedonia to come to you and by you to be helped on my journey to Judea. Therefore, I was not vacillating when I intended to do this. Was I? Or what purpose do I purpose according to the flesh so that with me there will be yes and yes and no and no at the same time? He says, what was the purpose of that? But as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silvanus and Timothy was not yes and no, but it is yes in him. The issue that you did not understand why I came does not mean that I was being two-faced cunning, vacillating, and deceiving and insincere. Paul was saying that when he initially expressed his intention to visit Corinth, okay, right, there was no pretense whatsoever in his words. He just didn't say that just for the sake of saying it. There was absolutely no pretensions in his words. Look at this very carefully. Now turn your Bible. I want to look at three scriptures with you just, to, just so that we can establish this truth. Okay? As God is faithful, he said thus in effect reinforcing his assurance with an oath. He's making a vow here. His communication with them was a well-meant yes. He meant to do this. And then other issues came up. 1 Corinthians 16, 5. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians 16, 5. 1 Corinthians 4, 19. And 1 Corinthians eleven thirty four. 34. So I want to put those three verses together so we can highlight this point. He says, in 1 Corinthians 16, 5. But I will come to you. After I go through Macedonia. For I am going through Macedonia. He says, but I will come to you. He's, talking, he's speaking to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 4.19. But I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. And I shall find out not the words of those who are arrogant but their power. And then in 1 Corinthians 11.34. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. He sincerely intended to come. And he will still come. And he would still come. But circumstances changed the timing of the planned visit. And I've had to experience that in ministry. As you will know, as we, as we go to the different countries and minister to the different churches that we have to oversee all over the world, and as we have to also, we train pastors through the seminary all, all the time. And there have been times that we just simply, we intended to come, we booked the date, we secured it, and did everything, but we were unable to. Circumstances developed in such a way that we were unable to. Not only that, but in addition to that, we were unable to get a visa at the last moment 
Uh, we were denied a visa, so we couldn't enter the country and so forth. So it's, things happen in life. And all of some people think that you're being insincere, that you're playing or you're toying with them. That's not what we're talking about here. And then in what almost seems a, um, a digression, a diversion here, he reinforces the truth, Paul, of God's own faithfulness and the utter trustfulness of the gospel message. Notice how he invokes all three persons of the Trinity to make this point. Now, going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Now, remember, we've been working through all these passages, right? One, we, we, we started out there, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We went through 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We went into 11, 12, 13. Now, we went into 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, okay? Now, and we jumped into 19. Now, we'll continue this because I want you to see what Paul is doing. And now, for this one brief moment, Paul, he invokes the Trinity in defending his sincerity. He says, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19 to 22, for the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who is preached among you by us, by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but yes in him. For as many are the promises of God in him, they are yes. For there also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge. Now Paul defends this great sense of, of sincerity okay, by invoking the God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit in his intent and how they operate. Paul was pointing out that his own sincerity as a messenger of the gospel, it was rooted in the truthfulness and the trustworthiness of the gospel itself. And that in turn reflects the un and that in turn reflects the unshakable faithfulness of the Trinity. So Paul had aligned himself up with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, with the message of the Trinity, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, very clearly. This was a sincere man. He was a sincere man, but he's dealing with people okay, who, uh, who were fickle as well. Next, Paul explained why there had been a change in his plans. Once again, he invokes a solemn oath to attest to his sincerity. Once again, he invokes a solid oath to attest to his sincerity. Turn your Bibles. And let's look at this now. We, went, we just read from 19 to 22. Let's pick it up at verse 23. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23 and 24. And then we're going to jump into 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. So let's look at this. And, and I want you to now, he, now he begins to explain why the delay. What happened. Up until this point, we're speculating as to the circumstances. Okay? In our heads. But remember, remember the whole issue about empathy? He understood them. He could feel their pain. But the best thing sometimes is not to confront somebody right at that moment. They're not ready. See, they're not ready to feel the, the wrath of God at that moment. They're not ready to feel your wrath either. They're not hearing you. They're not prepared, okay? They are not simply prepared to hear everything that they need to hear from, the, from, from your lips about whatever the situation is that's caused the conflict. Paul understood this. He loved them, he, he, he loved them but he knew them. He says, you know what, now is not the time. So he held back. Look at this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23 and 24. But I call God as a witness to my soul that to spare you, now underscore, to spare you, I did not come again to Corinth. I wanted to hold back the pain. Verse 24, not that we lord it over your faith, but our work is with you for your joy, for in your faith you are standing firm. 
So he held back. He knew they were not ready. Continued. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Now let's look at verses 1 through 4. But I determined this for my own sake, that I would not come to you in sorrow again. In sorrow, right? To you in sorrow again. Remember he had mentioned that earlier. He was not going to do that. He knew that he had to come to instruct them, to rebuke them, to teach them, to reprove them. He knew he had to come do that. But they were not ready. He was not ready to go back and just rebuke them again. So he says in verse 1, But I determined this for my own sake, that I would not come to you in sorrow again. Look at verse 2. For if I cause you sorrow, who then makes me glad but the one whom I made sorrowful? This is the very thing I wrote to you, so that when I came, I would not have sorrow for those who sought to make me rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy would be the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not so that you would be made sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I especially for you, which I have especially for you. In other words, whatever combination of circumstances may have contributed to the cancellation of Paul's visit, whatever they were, in his own time, and his own ultimate motive for postponing the visit was nothing other than his sincere compassion for the Corinthians. They were not ready for it. They were not ready for a face-to-face, mustache-to-mustache, belly-button, belly-button confrontation. They were not ready for that. So he sends this letter, and he allows the Word of God to do the ministering in their hearts. He did not want to come to them in sorrow. That's not what he wanted to do. In 1 Corinthians 2.1, again, he says, For when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. This is 1 Corinthians 2.1. I've jumped back a whole book. I want you to see that. He had delayed the visit in order to spare what? He wanted to spare the rod of discipline. He didn't want to have a face-to-face confrontation because they were not ready for it. Now, Paul was no coward. But he wasn't a bull in a china shop either. He understood when he had to confront and when he didn't have to confront. There were different ways of disciplining people. But he understood that, (coughs) excuse me, <clears throat> he understood that they were not ready for face-to-face confrontation. Look at this. So he wanted to spare the rod of discipline. He had not been insincere. He had acted merely out of love for them. He says, I better hold back. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, 1 Corinthians 1, 23, but we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. In 1 Corinthians 4, 2, in this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. He had to allow that truth to be established in their hearts and in their minds. In this vital but often overlooked passage of Scripture, we see highlighted, we see highlighted three, key, three keys to Paul's sincerity. Look at this. Number one. First, he always operated with a clear conscience. Paul always operated with a clear conscience. Can you, do you operate with a clear conscience? Secondly, he always sought to show himself reliable. He always sought to show himself reliable in what? In his words and his actions. His word was his bond. People did not need a contract with him. When Paul gave his word, like it's like when I was when I was raised, your word was your bond. You you shook your hand, that was done deal. You didn't need a contract. 
And this is exactly what Paul is expressing here. And third, as the, as the Corinthians themselves were well aware, his dealings with them were never self-serving or heavy-handed, but always driven by a genuine, tender affection for them. <clears throat> Here is why Paul's enemies were ultimately unsuccessful in portraying him as insincere and as being two-faced. They simply could not do that. Let me tell you something. Integrity maintains a clear conscience. That's what Paul is driving home into the hearts of the Corinthians. That's the reason why he writes 2 Corinthians. It becomes his entire defense. But in that defense, he has to expose, okay, how they had willingly believed the lies of others. So you understand that what Paul is doing here, integrity that maintains a clear conscience, Paul could do that. He could do it. See, that's what leadership has to learn how to do, okay? And a leader keeps a clear conscience. Can you do that? <clears throat> Notice that the first witness Paul calls in his defense of his sincerity is his own conscience. I thought that was quite unique the way he did that. He chose to go in a court of law, and he says, I'm going to defend myself, Your Honor. I don't need an attorney. I'm going to defend myself. And the very first thing he does, okay, is to present his integrity, and it's, and it's called into question by how? His clear conscience. He had never deliberately misled the Corinthians. Never did he deceive them with verbal trickery. Or even purposely vague, or, 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 or he had ever been purposely vague with them. He was always very clear in his language. You remember that in, in 2 Corinthians 1.13, he, <clears throat> he says, We do not write you anything we cannot read or understand. You remember that? For we write nothing else to you that we, you read, the, than what you read and understand, and I hope that you will understand until the end. He was always very clear. So his conscience was clear. And thus, he can defend his integrity. There was no double speak, no double talk. He was always very clear. 